This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Jonathan, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Hi, Bob. It's good to be back. I see that we've got you in the command center. Uh, I don't know if you were evacuated because of concerns about Antifa. <laughs> yeah, they're riding right outside my door. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what we're talking about today, folks, is, as you may have heard, Thomas Massey has introduced an end the Fed bill. And I came across this tweet thread from an Ed Krasenstein, Krasenstein, not sure how to pronounce his name. He's one of the twin brothers uh, that they're uh, AI futurists, Web3 and so forth. Uh, this guy's got a million plus followers, so this isn't just some nobody. And he was pretty uh, pretty up in arms about this plan. So let me just go ahead and read this original tweet, and then I'll let you respond, Jonathan, and we'll get into it. I'm sorry, but the Republican push to end the Federal Reserve via H.R. 8421, the Federal Reserve Board Abolition Act, is both irresponsible and just plain stupid, given they have no plan to replace it. Ironically, Republican Rep. Thomas Massey put out this letter, and he's got a screenshot of a press release that Massey put out to accompany the bill that I think Massey introduced. First of all, so this is Krasenstein back. First of all, the Fed did not directly loan money to the Treasury. So here's he's responding because Massey had said in his press release during COVID, the Federal Reserve created trillions of dollars out of thin air and lent it to the Treasury. And that just, you know, fueled the price inflation and stuff. So this is Ed responding. First of all, the Fed did not directly loan money to the Treasury. It purchased Treasury securities, which helped maintain low interest rates, which in turn allowed the Treasury to borrow funds cheaply. Trump even wanted the Fed to go further on this. He pushed for them to lower rates into negative territory for the first time ever. Why didn't Massey stand up to Trump when he was doing that? The idea that we will just abolish the Federal Reserve without replacing it has with re- without replacing it with anything is absurd. Virtually every developed nation in the world has a Federal Reserve or central banking system. Without it, our economy will have tremendous peaks and troughs, as well as huge volatility in interest rates, large recessions, and at some point, huge levels of unemployment like we haven't seen in decades. The U.S. dollar would almost instantly fall far from the top of the world's preferred currencies. Do people not realize this? Well, among adding to Thomas Massey, you and I, I guess, Jonathan, are also in the group of people who do not realize all of those things that he thinks are self-evident. So I have a bunch of stuff I could say, but you know, now that I've summarized it, do you want to take a shot at this? Yeah, sure. The first thing that I'll say is it's funny that he says uh, – uh, at some point, huge levels of unemployment like we haven't seen in decades. I mean, it's interesting that he chose decades as opposed to over a century since we've had the Federal Reserve over a century now. So he's actually he's referring to uh, recessions and high unemployment rates that we've seen since the Fed has been around. So if if he wanted to, he should have he he should have <laughs> right, said right. you know over a hundred years ago. Yeah, you're right. So he did. Yeah, and then later that was something. You're right. I didn't even catch it there because later. He got more specific and said we could have a, de- a great depression if we get rid of the Fed. And so people, like including me, were like, uh, "Do you know when the Fed was founded?" So in case you don't yeah. know at home, folks, the Fed was founded in 1913. You might remember the great stock market crash was in 29, and then the Great Depression is in the 1930s. So the Fed was up and running, doing its magic, stabilizing the economy for a good 16 years before the Great Depression started. And so it is ironic that he's saying, we got to have the Fed, otherwise we might have another Great Depression. And as, as you're saying, Jonathan, <laughs> even, yeah, we don't want to get rid of the Fed because then we might see unemployment like we haven't seen while the Fed was in operation. So, okay. Um, all right. Also, just on the Treasury stuff, I mean, these, we're sort of nitpicking here, and then we'll we'll pull back and, and, and get to the, the heart of the matter. But the he's, he's sort of trying to have it both ways, that he's saying, no, no, it's not that the the Fed is lending money to the Treasury. All it's doing is keeping interest rates low that allows the Treasury to borrow on cheaper terms. And I mean, so what's happening, folks, is the outside, you know, so yes, legally, if the Treasury is issuing new bonds, the Federal Reserve cannot be the one directly buying them from the Treasury. That's not legally allowed. And that's partly why when Jonathan and I are hitting the MMT errors, we get into it and you know, we point out that some of their claims about this is how the world works. It's like, well, that's actually not literally what happens. But anyway, but here, um, what we can grant the MMT is the sense that there is this a spirit in which 
yes, effectively the Fed is monetizing the debt in the sense that people in the private sector take on the new treasury issuance, they lend money to the treasury, that's how they fund the deficit. But then the Federal Reserve engages in open market operations and goes and buys treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities and all kinds of things to put on its balance sheet. And to do that, it, quote, creates money out of thin air. And so the reason the Fed can keep interest rates low, or one of the tools now at its disposal, is by creating more reserves, by buying assets, putting on its balance sheet. So it's the, the reason it keeps interest rates low, or one of the ways it keeps interest rates low, is because it goes and creates money out of thin air and buys the treasuries. If the Fed, I mean, it's what's weird, Jonathan, is it's like it's, if the Fed didn't do that, everybody is admitting that, oh yeah, the yields on treasuries would be higher. It, you know, and that's, that's one of the reasons, not necessarily Krasenstein in this tweet thread, but I've seen other people, and I have a jot in my notes for us to come back and address, have said, are you guys crazy if they get rid of the Fed? then borrowing costs for the treasury are going to go through the roof and everything. So it's, in any event, I, I'll stop there, but do you want to respond to that particular allegation? Yeah, uh, two things. Uh, number one, uh, the main reason why those primary dealers purchase the government debt is because they know that the Fed is a ready buyer of it. So they know that it's a very liquid asset that they can purchase because they know that the Fed is going to turn around and purchase it from them. So it's not like the it's not like the Fed is is acting purely independently. There there definitely is a sense in which the Federal Reserve is monetizing the debt, as you said. It's it's printing new money. And that even though it's going through this like little shell game, there's this little stepping stone to get over to the Treasury, um, it's 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 still in effect, it's as if the Fed is is purchasing uh, or lending the money to the federal government, even though it's going through this middleman. And one other thing that I'll mention here is that if you look back at the uh, different documents in the Federal Reserve's history, uh, one thing that they said uh, back in uh, World War II is, and actually also in World War I, uh, is they they said a part of their purpose, like one, one of their missions, one thing that they're supposed to do is to help fund the government during these big crisis episodes. So it's it's uh, it's definitely true that the Fed, at least one reason that it exists, is to lend money uh, freely to the federal government. Right, and I've seen, um, I think it was even Milton Friedman, but yeah, I think it was, where he was talking about you know ta- the original classical gold standard and like and then a, a, like a rigidly enforced one versus one that was more loosey-goosey. And I think he even said in one of his pop books, words to the effect of, oh yeah, the reason you know you, you might not want to have, like from the perspective of protecting the integrity of the dollar and so on and keeping price inflation low, yes, maybe you want to have a straitjacket on the monetary authority. But on the other hand, yes, if there's a major war, maybe you want your government to have the ability to inflate in order to, you know, so it's, it's funny that, the, the people rationalize and justify the central bank and then its ability to inflate in order to bail the government out when it has a major expense. But then when someone's criticizing the Fed for doing that, they're like, what are you talking about? The Fed doesn't do that. Uh, so since we brought it up, why don't we go ahead and tackle this issue of stability? So on this point, besides the obvious fact that the Great Depression and the Great Recession which you know, many people say that's the worst economic crisis that's faced the U.S. since the Great Depression. So the two worst examples of U.S. economic instability happened on the Fed's watch. And the first one, you could say, well, they didn't know what they were doing, but surely they should have had the kinks worked out by 2008. And in fact, um, it was Bernanke, right, who famously said that, you know, thanks to you, like talking to Milton Friedman, saying... Um, Thing. You're right. You're right, Professor Friedman. We we caused the Great Depression, but thanks to you, we won't. It won't happen again. <laughs> Have you, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you heard that? Uh, no, I haven't. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that it was. It was. It was before he was Fed chair. But yeah, they were at some event. Bernanke was like a member of the Federal Reserve hierarchy, I think, or he was. He was something. But um, and and there was an event that was. I think this was in like the early 2000s, and it was honoring Milton Friedman. And then Bernanke said something, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the spirit of this is definitely correct, said something like, I'm going to partially abuse my you know, a, a privilege here as the representative, blah, blah, blah. But on behalf of the Fed, I want to say to you, uh, Milton Friedman, yes, you're right, we did it, meaning caused the Great Depression. But he said, but thanks to your work, we won't do it again, or something like that. 
And so, ah, oh, great, you know, because this was the period, you know, the great um, moderation, as they call it, in the mm-hmm. early 2000s. Where, hey, we've cured the business cycle and did it. And then, no, that didn't happen. Um, so besides that, we've also got empirical evidence. So I know you have something you want to mention, Jonathan, but I'll mention. Th- so George, so this is the 2012 Journal of Macroeconomics. Uh and the title is Has the Fed Been a Failure? And there's three authors, George Selgin, Larry White, and William Lestrapes. Sorry, guys, I forget if I'm mispronouncing that guy's name. I always forget how to pronounce it. And so this was coming up on the 100th anniversary of the Fed. That's why they they did the, the research for this to get ready for that, because the Fed's 19, late 1913. So the abstract of this paper says, as the 100th anniversary of the 1913 Federal Reserve Act approaches, we assess whether the nation's experiment with the Federal Reserve has been a success or a failure. Drawing on a wide range of recent empirical research, we find the following. One, the Fed's full history, 1914 to the present, has been characterized by more rather than fewer symptoms of monetary and macroeconomic instability than the decades leading to the Fed's establishment. Right. So if you're looking at the entire track record of the Fed, and looking at business cycle instability, they're saying there was more instability while the Fed existed than in the decades prior to the establishment of the Fed. And then they push it even further and they said, suppose we take out the Great Depression. And they say, while the Fed's performance has undoubtedly improved since World War II, even its post-war performance has not clearly surpassed that of its undoubtedly flawed predecessor, the national banking system, which was in place before World War I. Okay, so they're saying it's a slam dunk. It's not even close. If you look at post-establishment of the Fed and compare that with the national banking system, which was the regime in effect in the decades before the Fed, it's not even close. The Fed period is way more unstable, among other things, it includes the Great Depression. But then they're saying even if you want to say, okay, that was kind of a fluke, it'd be unfair to lead, you know, to lay that at the feet of the Fed. It was a global phenomenon, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And they're saying just even post World War II, which everybody thinks, you know, the 50s and 60s was this great era of macroeconomic stability from Keynesian fine tuning and so on. Even just looking at that compared to the pre Fed era, it's closer, but it's still not obvious that the Fed's period is, is scores better. And these, and part of what's going on in this paper, we don't need to dwell on this. The reason that used to not be so obvious to people, but now as of, you know, this uh, 2012 paper, it, it, these guys aren't relying on like obscure Austrian data sets or something like th- they're relying on conventional mainstream literature. And partly what happened is some of the assessments of like output fluctuations in the late 1800s um, were exaggerated because people were relying on certain like wholesale price indices. And so if there were periods where like there had been a wartime inflation and then deflation following it, people thought that the deflationary period must have been an awful economy. But then, you know, more recent scholarship has said, no, actually, that that's not true. Okay, so that's that's part of what happened as to, you know, why the 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 opinion may have changed on this and why actually people are now saying that the pre-Fed era was more stable economically than people may have used to might have thought before. So that's partly what goes on here. So again, just besides our anecdotal quips about the Great Depression and Great Recession happening on the Fed's watch, even if you do like regression analysis and try to quantitatively assess it in terms of, you know, standard deviation of GDP growth or whatever, still it comes out that uh, the economy was more volatile after the creation of the Fed. Yeah, I was at the the Mises event where George Selgin presented that uh, his research for that paper. Uh, the The video is is on YouTube. It's called uh, "A Century of Failure." Um, and what was really interesting is, as you said, he in some of the data that he was looking at, he actually took out the Great Depression period. So he, it's almost like, okay, fine, we'll we'll say that that's a uh, like your first try. We'll, uh, we'll give you a mulligan on the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but then he, he, so he looked at the data after the Great Depression. And uh, one of the charts that I remember was uh, just looking at average unemployment rate. And it was higher after the Fed and excluding the Great Depressions when there was a huge amount of, of unemployment. Um, another uh, chart that he showed is, is one that we've all seen is, is just the CPI over the 20th century. And of course, there's there's you know steady price inflation after the the Fed is is uh, founded, 
Uh, but then once the, the 1971 event occurs where the Fed now has, has been unleashed from, the, from gold, uh, then it starts to skyrocket. It goes – there's a – it's like a watershed moment in, in price inflation history. Uh, so, so the Fed's track record is, is terrible. Um, and that, that talk by George Selgin, I remember um, I, I, was, I was younger. That was in 2012. I, I was – I was in graduate school at the time. I remember my eyes were open. It's like, wow, this this thing really is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, may, maybe we should just take a moment. You know, we're, we're getting in the weeds here. We're, but again, this is standard Austrian business cycle theory. So this, this shouldn't be shocking. What Jonathan and I are, are trying to do here is to show that this Krasenstein guy, it, it's not like we, again, have to appeal to our authority. Whoa, we love our Mises and we must be right. And we don't care what the data say. The, the, no, we're we're saying under any you know just again look casual reading of history shows you that there was a lot of economic calamity after the Fed was formed, and then even standard uh, you know econometric analysis of, of this kind that you know Selger and his co-authors did in that paper I just talked about, and that he's summarizing the talk that Jonathan here is talking about. That that's all standard, but in terms of like the Austrian school approach to the business cycle, it's the the banking system engages in credit, what Mises called credit expansion, right? So they lend out money that hasn't been prior, you know, it wasn't saved effectively. It artificially lowers the interest rate. So now that interest rate is not giving the correct um, guidance to entrepreneurs in terms of when they engage in economic calculation to know, you know, loosely speaking, what the, what the amount of so total savings is. And they engage in longer processes, sort of misled by those, those artificially low interest rates. Then there are adequate real savings to fund, and so they start lengthening the structure of production. But there's not enough to go around because you don't have more goods in process. You don't have more tractors. You don't have more uh, farmland just because the banks created some new credit, All right? And so that and that's the process. And then once that you know the banks chicken out, they stop flooding the market with so much cheap credit interest rates spike, and then there's a, a crash. So, I mean, that's the basic mechanism and a central bank just exacerbates that because the normal checks on the private commercial banks to limit that behavior, those checks all get get muted with the central bank. And primarily, like even the Fed, it, it was ostensibly formed in response to uh, what was the 1907 crisis. And then they had the Fed come in and one of its official justifications was to be a lender of last resort. So if you just think through what does that mean? Oh, when the private banks have been too aggressive, when they've created too much, you know, too, too much loans relative to the reserves they have and they get caught with their pants down, normally they would just go bust and then that would be a lesson and the, the next boom, you know, maybe some of the lenders would be more careful because they'd say, well, look, remember what happened to that bank last time? But no, not if there's a central bank that comes in and is a lender of last resort and can you know relieve banks of their obligations or just uh, bail them out. So that makes the banks more aggressive. So that's it fits in with the Austrian story that central banking we would expect to exacerbate the boom bust cycle because the, in the Austrian view, what causes depressions is the pre the preceding boom that the boom was was wilder and more unsustainable, and that's why the crash was harder. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. The the emphasis on the what the banking system by itself can do, you know, even taking out the central bank, because that that expl so a skeptical listener might might be thinking or may, maybe even saying it out loud if they're especially vocal. <laughs> is uh, they they might be they might be thinking, okay, guys, you're talking about how the Fed has caused all this volatility, uh, and since it was it was founded, we could see that in the unemployment. But how do you explain all the panics and depressions that happened before the Fed? And so what you just what you just described is is that explanation. So the reason why we had booms and busts uh, before the the Federal Reserve is because the commercial banking system, the private commercial banking system, was engaged in credit expansion during different periods, and it lines up. So there's been plenty of historical analysis. Look at uh, Rothbard's history of of uh, I think it's history of money and banking in the United States, where he goes through and he shows that when there's when there's this credit expansion. Uh, and a lot of times it is exacerbated even even before the central bank, uh, before the Federal Reserve, it's exacerbated by different uh, government banking regulations. Uh, but it it it's timed up perfectly. So so I'm really glad that you brought up that 
um, the the fact that it's the the main cause. And if you go back to Mises's uh, theory of money and credit, uh, he doesn't he doesn't really talk about the central bank as much as he talks about the issuance of fiduciary media in the mm-hmm. private banking system as causing the the business cycle. Right. So yeah, I'm I'm glad you emphasized that because when I was younger, I used to speaking loosely, like when I would try to go around and like after the housing bubbled and then bursting, I would go around and speak to like regular crowds, not people who were steeped in Austrian economics, trying to just explain what the heck just happened. And I would tell a quick story of, oh yes, the, you know, there was the dot-com bubble and then the crash and then Greenspan, who was the chair of the Fed flooded. And I would tell a whole story and it probably came off as if I we're saying that, oh, yes, the, the Austrian school story is that the Federal Reserve causes recessions. If you just heard me, and then you're right. So you, you, like, um, it's, it's important to be more careful about it. And also, too, this isn't us trying to patch up the holes in our theory after the fact. I mean, Mises, what the English title that has been given to it is the theory of money and credit, where he first lays out what we now call Austrian business cycle theory. That came out in 1912. Okay, so certainly... I mean, central banks had existed before then in other countries, but it, the Mises, like you say, Jonathan, he was explaining how is it that when banks engage in credit expansion, and, and that term means that, yes, if they lend money, as, as Jonathan says, if they issue new fiduciary media, right, so they have actual money in the narrower sense, you know, in the vault that customers have put it on deposit, and then the bank's issue loans on top of that. So the original customers still think they have access to that money, but now there's other people with claims on that money in the form of bank notes or checks, what have you, um, that that's what causes the boom bust cycle. That causes the unsustainable boom when banks do that. And then the issue was just what mechanisms can contain that. And at least as of when he wrote Human Action, Mises has some passages where he's in favor of what he calls free banking, but if you read them carefully, what he's saying is, yeah, I don't trust the government to do a good job restraining the banks because when the government needs money, it will just take away those constraints to let the banks create money to you know, indirectly or directly lend to the government. So he thinks, no, there's much more discipline. Reserve ratios will be higher if we have a regime of free banking. Okay, so just to uh, bring up our favorite bugaboo in the Austrian school of arguing over what did Mises think of fractional reserve <laughs> banking, that that's... It's not that he was, uh, you know, schizophrenic, as it were. Okay. Um, well, maybe now that we're talking about history, too, this is something. So I, I know uh, Ron Paul in his End the Fed book starts out, and he says, you know, let's let's not worry. Like, like a lot of people think getting rid of the Fed means that there's no more U.S. dollar. And even though maybe, you know, in Ancapistan, we want to have everything in terms of, you know, physical weights of gold or something. Still, you don't. That doesn't need to be the case. And I remember Ron Paul started out the end of the Fed book saying the Fed was only created in 1913. In 1912, Americans spent dollars at the store, right? So the U.S. government had the ability to create U.S. dollars before the Federal Reserve. And then also, you know, Andrew Jackson famously killed the Second Bank of the United States, which was the precursor of the Fed at that time. Um, and he even did stuff like. Uh, Instead of placing the U.S. government's deposits with that bank, you know, I think he put it into the state chartered banks or something, right? So I'm just saying, th- there's some, some people, and I've I've argued with MMTers online, and um, you know, they've argued with stuff, and I was like, well, if they wanted to, the Treasury could park its deposits, you know, at, at Citibank or something, and they're like, oh, you just got rid of the Fed, and I'm like, exact mundo, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying, like, some people seem to think. In order for the U.S. dollar to exist and in order for the Treasury to have a bank account, there has to be a Federal Reserve. And no, neither of those is true. Yeah, I think what they're doing is they're just confusing monetary policy operations with history. So, yeah, it's true that that dollars originate with the Federal Reserve printing up new ones. In fact, they all say Federal Reserve note uh, if, if you're looking at cash. Um, but that doesn't mean that dollars historically originated with the Federal Reserve. And in fact, what what you see throughout human history and even U.S. history uh, is that we the money predates the government, money predates central banking, 
Uh, and what what the government has done is that it has co opted the the monetary institution. It's it's taken over it, and for obvious reasons, it's because it can easily fund itself if it has control over the printing press. But I I think that's what they're doing. I think they I think they see where money comes from in our modern day economy, and then they just sort of you know extrapolate that back and say that's that's the history. So if if new money comes from the Federal Reserve, that means that if we got rid of the Federal Reserve, the money would go away. Yeah, and it's uh, and this kind of goes back to that Krasenstein original tweet that I read, where he's worrying that oh, the U.S. dollar would fall from its preeminent spot. I, I think it's the other way around. That you know, if they did transit, so of course, yes, if they transition to some system, and the federal government said, "Well, geez, we've been reading this work by uh, this guy Murphy," and we just let let the private sector do it, and we can have you know b- commercial banks can issue notes on you know gold, and if you want to get into cryptocurrencies, you can do that, and, and we're just going to discontinue dollars. Well, then yes, in that sense, the U.S. dollar <laughs> would no longer be you know coveted around the world because it just wouldn't exist. But assuming they did something, and we'll talk in a minute here about like what possible transitions could there be, where like the Treasury goes back to issuing uh, you know, notes that are stamped as dollars or something like that presumably it would be stronger, right? In other words, if the Fed didn't inflate as much, then that would make the dollar an even more desirable currency relative to the other ones around the world. So I'm saying the the dollar is still coveted by people around the world in spite of the fact that the Fed has inflated so much. And so, and, and you know, and I don't know in terms of his tweet, whether Krasenstein meant, because he he packaged a bunch of wild warnings altogether that, oh, there's going to be, you know, a massive unemployment and crazy instability, and then no one's going to want to hold the dollar. So I don't know if he meant the reason foreigners wouldn't want to hold dollars anymore is because the U.S. is just an economic basket case without, you know, the loving guidance of the Fed. But I'm saying just in strict terms, assuming Jonathan and I are right and that history repeats itself and getting rid of the Fed actually promoted economic stability, well, then the fact that there's also not this agency that can create $3 $3 trillion in a year just by snapping its fingers, other things equal, that would make investors more willing to like soak up dollar-denominated assets because they would know, yes, I don't have to worry that if there's some crisis, the Fed might just all of a sudden create a bunch of new money and dilute the value of my asset. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned the like the the technical aspects of like how do we go from one monetary regime to another one. There's a great uh, series of articles, essays that uh, Rothbard wrote in the mid '90s for the Freeman, um, and they've recently been republished at uh, Mises.org uh, called uh, "Taking Back Our Money" or, or "Taking Our Money Back." I can't remember which one, uh, but the specific essay where he talks about. Uh, his, his idea of how we could ab- abolish and liquidate the abolish the Federal Reserve and liquidate its assets is is in an article called uh, "How to Free Ourselves from Government Money," Part Three. So it's the last one in the in mm-hmm. the series, and he just talks about what what are the goals here. Uh, he says. Um, our goal may be summed up simply as the privatization of our monetary system, the separation of government from money and banking. Um, and then he goes through all of the different uh, types of assets that the Federal Reserve holds and uh, what what just needs to be marked off and what needs to be sold, uh, what needs to be liquidated. Um, uh, one, uh, one thing that's interesting in this essay that's relevant to our discussion here uh, is he talks about the people who uh, – they. They criticize the idea of ending the Federal Reserve, and they they say that it's it's like too complex. Like you're proposing this really simple solution to a really complex problem, um, and it reminds me to the the to the tweet that we're uh, discussing here. He says it might be thought that the mix of government and money is too far gone, too pervasive in the economic system, too inextricably bound up in the economy to be eliminated without economic destruction. Conservatives are accustomed to denouncing the terrible simplifiers who wreck everything by imposing simplistic and unworkable schemes. Our major problem, however, is precisely the opposite, mystification by the ruling elite of technocrats and intellectuals who, whenever some public spokesman arises to call for a large-scale tax cuts or deregulation, intone sarcastically about the dimwit masses who, quote, Seek simple solutions for complex problems. Sorry for the long quote. Let me continue. It's it's great stuff from Rothbard. Well, in most cases, the solutions. I'd much rather are, hear him than you. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, in most cases, the solutions are indeed clear cut and simple. 
but are deliberately obfuscated by people who, who we might call terrible complicators. In truth, taking, our money, taking back our money would be relatively simple and straightforward, much less difficult than the daunting task of denationalizing and decommunizing the communist countries of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. So what Rothbard is, show, is explaining, and, and he's just sort of giving a preview of, mm-hmm. of what he talks about in the essay, is that it, it really is a simple solution. Um, it, it might be a complex problem, uh, but there is a simple solution to it, which is to just abolish it and liquidate. And that's what Thomas Massey has in his bill, by the way. Uh, he, he has provisions for uh, and directions for the, the people who are in charge of how to liquidate uh, the assets of the Federal Reserve and transfer its liabilities to the Treasury. Oh, OK, great. So, yeah, I, I did not have a chance to study that legislation. So you, you went through and perused the actual bill? Are you telling me you didn't do research, Bob? I did research, but just not on that part. <laughs> I mean, in fairness, there's going to be a lot of people voting on that bill who didn't read it either. So, I mean, if, if I <laughs> well, were in Congress, I would definitely read it. It's it's very short. It's like three pages, um, and it just gives simple instructions of of transferring the assets and li- or liquidating assets and any remaining liabilities uh, go over to the Treasury. Uh, one one thing, since Rothbard talks about uh, it, in his essay, he's not just talking about abolishing the Federal Reserve, but also how to get back to a gold standard. Uh, which means redefining the dollar to be a certain amount of gold. Mm -hmm. And he talks about some of the issues there and the amount of gold that the Federal Reserve owns. So if you look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, it says it has like $11 billion worth of gold. Does that sound right? It sounds right. Uh, But but what's interesting is that the way that they're valuing that is based on $42.22 per troy ounce of gold, which is – way less than the current market price. And so like if you if we revalue that item on their balance sheet to to the current market price of gold, then we would have a, a better idea of the market value of at least that line on their balance sheet. It would be that, just based on rough calculations I did, it'd be hundreds of billions of dollars worth of gold that they own. Assuming that they didn't short, you know, short sell it into the market and that really the vaults are empty. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's but, assuming that the gold is there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, folks, I mean, we're we're joking aside here. Um, I mean, the, the, the vaults may be empty, but <laughs> so what Jonathan's talking about. If you go to the Fed's balance sheet, and I'm saying this because I recently did this for a, a different purpose. Um, specifically, what I was doing was an MMT. Some MMT guy said if the federal government paid off all its debt, there'd be no more dollars in existence. So I went through and showed on the Fed's balance sheet, like, no, that's just not true. And you can, you know, if if they if everything got paid off, that the Fed would still have it. And one of the elements, in other words, other assets backing up, as it were, the outstanding dollar liabilities besides treasury securities that the Fed owned as assets. Um, and one of those assets that the the Fed owns on its books, as Jonathan says, is, is gold. And so that partly goes back like the historical, like under FDR, when the commercial banks and others had to turn their gold in, um, you know, so there, there was an element there. And and so the point is a lot of that stuff is carried either at the historical cost or if they marked it up, you know, when the when the federal government revalued gold. But still, as, as Jonathan's saying, it was never allowed to float like after 1971. It, it was still just kept at those like book prices. And I think so, it was. Yes. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it was 77 is when they instituted the $42 figure. Or, yeah. Yeah. So it's. um. So the point being that, yes, there's this, quote, official gold price that the government uses internally to value its inventory, but the actual market price is, is way higher. And so, as Jonathan's saying, if, if they did want to you know, have something backing it up like that, that's how it worked. I don't know if you've ever seen, Jonathan, but Mises in, I think it, came, it was essays that came out in the 50s, possibly in the 60s, but I think it was in the 50s. And they included it in like later editions of the theory of money and credit. And he has a proposal for how the U.S. would go back on gold. And I don't know if it dovetails exactly with what Rothbard said, but it was real straightforward because there, there is at first when you go to if you say, hey, should the, should the U.S. government go back on the gold standard? There's the issue of, well, at what price? Because it would be kind of crazy to try to go back, you know, to the historical prices, like, you know, back even ni- in the 1970s, let alone to go back to, you know, the 1933 price. Um, but the other hand is like, well, what, what do you do? And you just pick a number out of the air. That seems kind of arbitrary, you know, to go ahead and do that. And so what Mises said is if, if a major country like the U.S. wanted to go back, it would be pretty straightforward. They would just go ahead and first announce 
that they were going back and then they would watch what happened to the market price of you know the of gold quoted in dollars and then you know they would take the average of that like they'd, they'd let that play around for a month or something and then they'd take the average of that and just lock that in and then going forward any new dollars that were created would only be if somebody from the public came to the government and turned in actual you know physical gold and then you would get that exact amount in in currency or even and he even wanted to impose it on the commercial banks mm-hmm. so if you wanted to get you know an extra hundred dollars in your checking account balance at the bank you would have to you know give them either actual gold or you know like tickets that were airtight one to one claims to gold and so then they're so the going forward any new dollars created would be backed 100% by the gold so that wouldn't instantly make the entire dollar stock backed up 100% by gold reserves but his point was going forward any new dollars would be so over time the entire system would you know tend towards 100% gold backing of the of the dollars and the the price wouldn't be arbitrary it would have been you know that let the market figure it out in the beginning once the announcements made let everyone adjust to the new reality and then lock that in so anyway i just thought that was a pretty elegant proposal just showing that mises was not this dogmatic crank that was just no 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 it's got to be you know gold coins and it has to have the old austrian empire emperor on it or, you know, like it was you know a pretty practical solution in terms of what would the us government do next thursday mises if they were going to follow your advice. Yeah, what's interesting is that uh, in this Rothbard essay that I mentioned, he's he's got a few different scenarios of like what that what that exchange ratio would have to be uh, depending on because obviously Rothbard wants to get back to 100% reserve banking at the same time as he's mm-hmm. abolishing the Fed and going back to the gold standard. And so he was talking about um the uh checking account deposits and other types of uh, accounts that people would have uh, in commercial banks, and if we include these types of accounts, then the exchange ratio would have to be X, and if it's mm-hmm. a if it, if it's a different set, it'd have to be Y. So, so Mises and Rothbard sounds like they did their due due diligence and thought about it. So, I I think so. I haven't read that Rothbard essay in a while. I think there's a slight difference in what they're doing there. And folks, you know, worst case, you go read both of them, and I'm wrong. And they're actually saying the exact same thing, in, in which case you've just read both of them and you're going to be wiser for it. But I think – It's it's definitely different. I wasn't trying to say that oh, they're the okay. same. I, All right. I'm just saying that they both put some thought into yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so just to finish the train of thought just for the listeners since now it looks like we're in agreement, John. Yeah, I, so I think Rothbard wanted to say implement my reform and then on day two – all the U.S. dollars are backed 100% by gold according to this ratio. You know, like in other words, figure out how much gold do we have backing up the you know, the existing quantity of dollars and just say that's the ratio. So now by definition, they're back, you know, they're backed up. Um, and then, and so of course there, when you say, well, what, when you talk about the quantity of dollars that you're now saying are backed up, what are you talking, you're talking about M0? Are you talking about, which yeah. is just, you know, reserves plus currency, or you talk about M1, which includes checking account deposit, you know, that kind of stuff. So yep. there it would matter. Whereas with Mises, yeah, he was just saying, no, you just use the market price and say, that's the ratio. Let that, you know, that's the, the definition. Okay. Going forward to get, you know, n- new dollar, you need to give us whatever, $2,287 to get, or sorry, an ounce of gold will get you a new $2,287 if that's what the market price happened to be per ounce. Um, going forward, and it, you wouldn't be on 100% reserves on day two with that proposal, but over time, the system would, you know, asymptotically approach 100% reserves. So anyway, that's just two different ways of um, of skinning the cat, as it were. Okay, I guess last thing maybe we'll, we'll just hit here as we close up, Jonathan. So what about the critics who say, are you guys nuts? If they were to do this, there would be a massive crash. So for one thing, interest rates you know, on, on treasuries would spike and there probably would be a huge crash. Oh, so, I mean, I don't know if there'd be a huge crash. There might be some short-term pains, you know, but there'd be some long-term gain. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it would take a while for the system to get used to something as big and as... Uh, as so the, Fed, the Fed is involved in so many different things. Um, and has a huge impact on financial markets today. So if like you take that out, I mean, there's going to be a reaction. Uh, but of course, the the long term benefits, uh, even the medium term, I, I think it would be it would really would be like a short term sort of adjustment uh, that would happen. Uh, but th- even into the medium term and the long term, we would have 
uh, more stable economic growth, better price stability, uh, stronger economy, better capital accumulation. All all the bad things that we say about the Fed would be gone. So we would ha- we would be better off. Yep, I agree with that. And then I would just say on top of that, if there is going to be so. It wouldn't surprise me if there were a big crash. And so here, Jonathan's not responsible for for my views, but my particular view right now, given the U.S., the yield curve has been inverted for a long time. So I have thought we were in an unsustainable boom fueled by the Fed. And so I think if the Fed, you know, sharply uh, continue to, or sorry, once the Fed starts cutting interest rates again, be seeing a recession coming, then you'd see the familiar pattern. The yield curve would then uninvert. And if history is a guide, then I think there'd be a big recession. And so that would be just a classic, you know, boom bust cycle that the you know, Fed pumped in a bunch of money during COVID and then tightened. And then once it started relaxing, everything's falling apart. So to me, that would be pretty straightforward. So if the Fed were to, you know, right now just totally close up shop, I do think that, yeah, you you might pull the crash forward. But in other words, it's continuing the Fed's existence would not eliminate crashes. It would just postpone it and make the reckoning harder, or maybe you could say it kind of spreads it out over 10 years where it allows a little bit of the pain and they flood the markets again and that pushes it back. And so, But you're not in the long run avoiding the pain. And as Jonathan's saying, as Austrian economists, the Fed is definitely screwing things up. You're not doing the economy any favors by creating artificial credit that's not backed up by genuine savings, by distorting you know, the, the price system, and by rewarding politically connected players and, you know, giving them more purchasing power than other companies that, you know, are not in the good graces of the Federal Reserve. So, um, you know, d- getting rid of all that certainly is going to be good in the long run. And if there is short term pain, again, it's the kind of thing where you're not going to avoid the crash. It's just a matter of when with the timing of it. Mm-hmm. Well, one other thing I'll add here is uh, in Massey's bill, he's got a one year expiration date. So, so after the enactment of the bill, and he just says the the Federal Reserve will be abolished one year from the enactment of the bill. So there, there would at least be some mm-hmm. some time for people to figure things out. It's not like it's not like we're pulling the carp the rug out from under anybody. Uh, mm-hmm. there, there's like this. He, he's got a one year period, and of course, a bunch of t- different people are going to have opinions on what that period should be. Some people would press the button to eliminate it now. Mm-hmm. Other people might say like a one year period or like you said, a 10 year period. Um, but, but yeah, so he's got the one year period in there. Okay. Well, that's, I think a good place to wrap up. Otherwise we'll go on for a year. <laughs> so, uh, Jonathan, thanks as usual for your time and insights. All right. Thanks for having me, Bob. Thanks for joining us again, folks. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.